The Cayman Islands, known for its stunning beaches, financial services, and home to some of the wealthiest businesses in the entire world, you'd be forgiven for thinking that this isn't a hotbed for the beautiful game. But you see, football is not only alive, it's kicking and prospering in all of its infinite wizardry. Our guest tonight is the man that plays a huge part in delivering this. From taking over a country without an international victory in over nine years to the cusp of Nations League glory, Global Football Part 3 welcomes Ben Pugh, international manager for the Cayman Islands. So sit back, strap in, relax, because you're listening to the wonderful sounds of the TTM podcast. Okay, my name is Glenn Pugh and I am the head coach of the Cayman Islands men's national team and you're listening to the TTM podcast. Hello and welcome to the TTM podcast episode 10. You're listening to part three of our global football series and we're delighted to introduce Mr. Ben Pugh, the international football manager of the Cayman Islands. Ben, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm really good, thank you. How are you guys? Yeah, we're good. We're good. Yeah, very, very good indeed. Really happy that you've um, made it onto the TTM podcast as part of this uh, global football series that we've got going on at the moment is generating a lot of interest. And uh, we've really been looking forward to the Cayman Islands one and delighted to have you on the show. Um, What we'll do for our listeners, first of all, Ben, is um, really just ask you to really talk about how you got into football in the beginning and your journey. Yeah, sure. So um, I think like most people, I've played football from a very young age and Uh, fell in love with the game and um, kind of watched it, played it. Every minute I wasn't at school, I was playing football. Um, Was reasonably good. Um, Kind of represented the county at 14, 15, 16. Had trials, but wasn't quite good enough. And um, always had aspirations of of being a professional. But kind of when I got to college, I realised that I went to quite a good um, football college scheme at Berry Town. And it was... Um, kind of one of the best in the area at the time but when I got there I kind of realised that maybe I wasn't as good as, as what I thought I was and, and kind of all the better players those that had been released from Ipswich and Colchester and Cambridge went to that programme and, and it was kind of from then that I realised maybe maybe I'm not going or I'm not going to be a professional footballer and, um, but because I loved the game and because um, I wanted to, uh, to work at the top of the game I thought what can I do to um, to have that, have that chance of, of working with the best players, of, of being involved in a, an elite environment. And so from quite early on, from kind of 16 up, I started coaching, um, doing my badges and, and got involved with Ipswich. Um, I actually went to, um, I did a sports science degree and whilst I was there, I met a, a friend of mine who was coaching at Ipswich at the time. And um, I started working voluntary with the under eights. And, and that was the start of kind of an, an eight year journey, which saw me working voluntary with, um, eight all the way up to working with academy age groups and leading the youth development phase so the, the 12 to 16s and helping out with the under 18s and um, yeah that, that's kind of how it started and it built quite quickly really. I think it's um, really good and a testament to Ipswich Town that they're actually promoting from within and developing their own coaches um, yeah. which is really good I mean a lot of clubs these days as you're aware will just spend money and they'll, they'll bring people in from all over the world and you know just mm. because uh, someone has a foreign name for instance they'll bring them in and you never know sometimes they might do a better job but most of the time I think developing from within in any business seems to be the way forward so full credit to Ipswich for that. Who would have been the manag- who would have been the manager at the time there, Ben? Um, so Mick McCarthy was the manager at the time, and um, it was him. Obviously, I, I, I would watch their sessions, and, and we were in the same building, so I'd I'd see them on a daily basis. And and both him and Terry Connor, who was the assistant, yeah. were just outstanding people. Like on a personal level, they were fantastic, and kind of I, I took a lot from that in terms of how to treat people. And if you look at both of those, regardless of whether they won, draw, or lost 
their mentality was exactly the same. They, they would speak to everybody in the morning. They would shake hands with, with everybody, whether you were um, a staff member, whether you were coaching, whether you were um, the ladies who cleaned the kit, whether you worked in the kitchen. Uh, he was just, a, the, both of them were outstanding people and, and kind of those values um, followed the academy all the way through. Um, and uh, yeah, no, it's, it's a really good place. And I think if you look at the players who are now, have gone through and playing in the first team, the academy boys, I think that it echoes the, um, the importance of that, that family-based club. So, no, so it's a really good club. Whereabouts, um, for instance, in, obviously you say, you say Ipswich, and whenabouts were the years where you were there then? What sort of year did you sort of join Ipswich Town and then end up leaving Ipswich? So, yeah, so I started coaching, I can't remember the exact year, but I must have been, I don't know, um, I was there eight years and I came here two years ago, so I guess about 2010. So I started okay. coaching in 2010, um, like I said, a variety of age groups and went from being part voluntary to part-time and then part-time to full-time. Um, at first I assisted the youth development phase and then I, I led the youth development phase just before I left, so um Eight years sounds like a long time, but looking back, it went quite quickly. And yeah, um, it was nice because it was a variety of working with every age group. Um, and so kind of having that, that um, experience working with kind of six and seven year olds, yet also working with players that are almost on the fringes of the first team. So um, would you really have um, come into contact then with Tyro Mings before his uh, transfer to Bournemouth? Yeah, so yeah, he was there. I didn't, uh, I was uh, part time at the time, so I didn't see a, a lot with him, uh, mm. a lot of him, sorry. Um, I know um, uh, I was there were, were a few others. So we, if you look at the players that have come through, we've had people like Connor Wickham, um, who went yeah. on to um, obviously playing for Palace now. And there's also a lot of ex-players there, uh, people like Kieran Dyer, people like Titus Bramble, James Scowcroft, um, and a variety of others. They're a real uh, good group of, of ex-players that go in there. And we've also got quite a few, or there's also quite a few good young players who have, there's a, a lad, Marcelo Flores, who was at Ipswich. He's now at Arsenal. He just signed a pro with Arsenal. We've got Ben Knight, who's at Man City, who, um, again, as a, a pro at Man City, they paid a lot of money for him. So it's, uh, it's a club definitely based on development. And um, yeah, from what I hear, Tyrone was a really good guy and people speak very highly of him. Not that I, I didn't know him personally. So they've actually, they're going through a bit of a sort of a transitional period. So I know that potentially... Mick McCarthy often quite vocal, not necessarily yeah. the money there to invest in the squad. Yeah. Um, so, so it sounds like really that the emphasis at Ipswich is on the development. I know they've had to maybe drop down into League One now, but hopefully that will give them a chance, you know, blood the youngsters and hopefully get, get back up in the championship with a good young side, hopefully. Yeah, hopefully, like I said, yeah, it's a, it's a very young squad. And then um, the beauty of being in the lower divisions is you can use those younger um, academy players maybe if you're you're in the Premier League or in the Championship it's maybe more pressure to um, stick with those older more experienced players so no one likes being relegated but in terms of club development um, and player development it's certainly been a bonus in that in those eyes. I think yeah, um, yeah Ipswich have been through a lot I remember when I was very young um, Premier League I think maybe at the turn of the millennium I remember when Ipswich Town yeah. got promoted when I finished third I had Marcus Stewart Richard Wright I believe at some point yeah. in goal for them Correct. as well yeah, I, I remember. Uh, I was used to like yeah. Martin Reusser, the Dutch, yeah, the Dutch winger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was he used was to a like good player. With um, a moustache. We are, we are real football purists, um, if we're honest. You know, we were having a conversation um, the other day on LinkedIn with Julian Jochim. So I think um, that's okay, someone nice. that we're looking to try and get, really. But uh, um, back, back to obviously yourself. So at the moment, you've, you've been through a lot of coaching. You've been at Ipswich for eight years. Um, what, what then happens, Ben? Yeah, so um, I think like any club, you have connections with different parts of the world because people bring players over and not necessarily for trials, but more for experiences. So um, there was um, a few people that brought players over from the Cayman Islands and not that I didn't know them directly, but people from the club knew, knew those and um, an opportunity came up to work with a club here, which was an amateur club, um, but a, a very good amateur club that... Um, that kind of were doing really good things in terms of youth development and pushing players through and trying to get players scholarships in, in the US and, and in England and, and various other countries. Um, and I quite liked the project and I thought, if it's, it, maybe the job isn't as good as what I'm doing, but it's a life experience. I don't want to get to 
however old and say, well, I've only ever lived in Ipswich and, and not excited. I love to travel um, anyway. So um, I thought, you know, I'll, I'll go and see what it's like. And I worked at that club for, for a year and quite quickly after I got here, um, I started kind of volunteering and helping out um, the technical director at, at the Cayman Lions Football Association, um, a guy called um, Alex Gonzalez, a, a Cuban guy. And, and between us, we developed the football, uh, the, the island's philosophy, the country's philosophies and DNA and ways of playing and um, trying to structure the youth and senior leagues a bit better. And also he was um, the, the senior team or the head coach of the national had just left as well. So he was kind of doing an interim role and I helped him out as an assistant there. So um, I helped him for one game and I, I took most of the training and, and that was in the March. And, and soon after that game, they, they gave me the, the job full time. So um, I worked with the, the senior men's team and also the U23s for the World Cup qualifiers. Um, and then, yeah, kind of kind of built from there. And, uh, and as I said, after, after a, a year of being here, I then moved on full time to the and to the Football Association. And have you ever, um, on the touchline, we, we are speaking to uh, Dan Neville, um, he says he's going to be coming across, who's hitting in the opposite dugout. Um, have you, yeah. have you um, looked across the opposite dugout and thought, Jesus Christ, you know, have you, uh, have you come up against anybody yet of any stature? Yeah, I think everybody. I think there's, um, so we've played, the, the games I've been involved in were, were Montserrat, which was Willie Donachy, who was a, uh, assistant coach at Newcastle for a long while um, yeah, yeah, yeah. And, the, and the other teams have again had some very high profile managers yes, we've played um, Barbados we've played US Virgin Islands and we played St. Martin um, we're, so kind of good caliber of, uh, of coaches and players especially coming from if you look at our team we're, ma- we're, we're mainly based of island or sorry by, uh, island based players we have um, and I think every team we've played have had a, a number of uh, professional players and that's been a, a challenge for us to, or our players to have to deal with. And, and I think then we've now got the FIFA World Cup qualifiers where we've actually been drawn against Canada, which is uh, obviously a, a very tough game, um, but a fantastic experience for our players and, you know, potentially playing against a, a Champions League winner. Um, so that might, yeah. I think that will be a, a great experience. That'll be here as well, which will be great for the island. And I know obviously... COVID at the moment is, a, is of course an issue so hopefully that um, we can have those games and, and we're quite lucky here that there's very few cases and we've been almost COVID free on and off uh, for a couple of months so everything's kind of back to normal in terms of uh, the football scene, the youth leagues, the, the senior leagues, um, all we're missing is the tourism in- industry and unfortunately the, the island is built on tourism so certain yeah. sectors of the island are struggling but uh, football is, is kind of back to normal. So you touched on the um, your games with St. Martin, Barbados, and the, and the U.S. Virgin Islands in, in, the, uh, in the Nations League. Now, you guys actually had a really strong Nations League campaign, um, 100% home record. Um, a particular standout result for me is the 3-2 win against Barbados at home. Yeah. Um, coming off the back of nine years without a win of the Cayman Island, for the Cayman Islands since you, when you took over, no win in nine years. Um, how pleased are you with that Nations League campaign? You must be very proud of that. Yeah, massively. And, and it, it was, um, I was really pleased for, kind of for everybody. It had been a rough few years um, for a number of reasons. And, and like I said, nine years without a win. And it was, um, I felt like we just needed a bit more structure. So we, we had a real clear game plan for all of those games. And I think especially like Barbados, I think they probably underestimated us a little bit, knowing that we hadn't won a game for nine years. And, um, and, and to be fair, credit to the players, they were outstanding across the whole, the whole campaign and to narrowly miss out on goal difference was, of course, um, disappointing, but massively proud of how we did. As I said, you said won four out of six games and um, won every game at home. So um, really, really pleased and hopefully that's something we can carry on in the, in the next process. I think if you look at um, our long-term goals, qualifying for a World Cup is going to be extremely difficult as we know but um, qualifying for a gold cup may be a possibility one day so if we were to win the Nations League group in the, in the next process you then go into two qualifying games and if you win those um, you get into the gold cup sounds simple but those two games might be against the likes of I think this year so Barbados I think play uh, to play Guyana and if they win they have to play Haiti so again a very tough process yeah. but nevertheless uh, um, 
something we we, we aim towards and, and something we're building towards. We so you look at you look at someone like a Guyana, relatively new nation, um, similar similar to to yourselves in a way, where it's not not really a well known world sort of power. They've they've done well. They qualified for the Gold Cup. You know, yeah. it, it it can be done. Um, Definitely, you know, I, I think don't Bermuda's think... another example, right? Bermuda's mm. another example of that. Someone who's done outstandingly well, but yeah, sorry. So yeah, it, it, it can be done. You know, there's. I think the talent in in the Caribbean is often not really spoken about. I think there's there's depth there, and there's certainly opportunities for the smaller nations to get get you know get through to these competitions. Yeah, definitely. I think another monster or another team who are yeah. um, an island of kind of twelve thousand people who um, have done exceptionally well and have a real good um, identity and, and program. And I think if, if it's like anywhere, if you if you get the right organisation and you get the right people involved and uh, you build that environment and that culture, which um, everybody kind of is working towards the same goal, I think you can certainly you know achieve something i agree i think the caribbean is there's some very very good players that i've seen in, in our games and in in other games of players that should be playing at a much higher level like like i said we've got players in my opinion who could be who should and could be playing at a higher level and we had a couple go on um on trial in the us um, and we're supposed to go back into another couple of clubs but obviously due to the current uh, climate it was impossible um but yeah i think that the caribbean has a as i said has a, has a lot of potential yeah, absolutely. Am I right in saying that um, your main rivals, if you do have any, would Cuba? Would the Cuba game be a be a big one for the for the nationalists sort of on the island? Um, I wouldn't say so. It's our closest. That and Jamaica are the to- closest two countries to here. But we have quite a good relationship, especially with Cuba. Our technical director is Cuban, and um, he worked actually as the national team head coach for Cuba for a number of years. So uh, we played them in a, a friendly, a couple of friendlies. Um, must have been a couple of years ago, just after I got I got here, and we played in Montserrat in the March and in the July we played Cuba twice, and we actually did quite well. We lost one nil and we drew nil nil. So, um, and they were actually preparing for their uh, Nations League games against the US and Canada. So, um, we were pleased with that, and, and actually, on the contrary, we have quite a good relationship with them. So, um, I think you're doing a good uh, job. If I'm honest, yeah. I think um, I think you you should be absolutely proud of yourself and what you're achieving. Is Jason Roberts uh, still obviously a member of Concacaf? Do you have any dealings with him at all? I know Mr. Neville of the yeah. BVI deals with him. Is he is he um, involved? Yeah. So um, especially during this this time where uh, over uh, uh, this period of time, we've spoken quite a lot with Jason, and I've been on quite a few uh, webinars with Dan as well. Um, looking at uh, they put on they put on I think it was a six week. Um, webinar series were speaking about different areas for all the uh, coach educators and uh, technical directors of of all the Caribbean countries so that was really good in terms of networking um, and in terms of just kind of everybody pulling towards the the same thing and and trying to get Caribbean football better so yeah speak to speak to Jason now and again really top guy doing some fantastic work with CONCACAF so um, and as I said Dan Dan's a, a really good guy in the BVI as well. So you mentioned um, earlier that, that the vast majority of your players um, for your national side are based uh, on the island. Now, um, just from basic research from myself, we've got a very young average age of the squad, um, primarily island-based. That probably creates a really good team spirit, I'd imagine, and probably easier for you to get your philosophies across. Now, um, in terms of team, team selection, What's your sort of scouting network like? Are you primarily watching domestic games to, in order to get your players or, or have you got a bit of a further reach? You know, and you've got a couple of players on your radar from Portugal. Um, noticed as well, really randomly, one from Clenefli as well and uh, one at Westfields as well in the non-league system in the UK. How are you going about looking to improve by you know casting a net out, or is it literally those players of, that you you're aware of them anyway, and they've gone from the domestic leagues onwards, and you know under your guidance sort of thing? Yeah, sure. So we have obviously quite a small network of players. The island's only just over sixty thousand people, um, and out of that, I think only probably two thirds are actually eligible to uh, to play for us. Um, there's a large uh, influx of British and American and Jamaican and. Uh, various other uh, nationalities here so um, the, 
the senior league here is it's moved on quite well. So last year there were 12 teams. This year we have 21, um, which has been split into two leagues. Um, and, and the second or the first division, um, the second tier is primarily made up of UA teams. But what we're doing is we're trying to get them um, playing men's games as much as possible so they're better prepared. Even when our U17 national team games come up, hopefully they'll have that, that bit more experience. So, um, yeah, so my, we have a very young team. Um, we have a couple that are in the US um, at school. Uh, one who came back for our last couple of games against um, USVI and then away at Barbados. Um, and like I said, yeah, we have a few players overseas who we, we keep regular contact with. Um, there's one in Romania, um, the guy from Wales is actually back now, but we've got a couple in the lower leagues in England and, um, and as I said, a couple playing in the US as well. So um, I speak to them now and again, they'll send me clips or highlights of their games or even a full game sometime. Um, and because it is quite a small pool, it's easy to keep tabs on them. Um, I don't think we're missing too many players in terms of, uh, or I don't think there's too many players we don't know about um, that, are, that, that could play for us. Um, so, like, yeah, we're, we're mainly made up of the players in the league, but we'll certainly consider those and we look to bring those back for games because though the league is, like I said, has improved, uh, it's not the level of, it's certainly not the level that these players overseas are playing. So when they come back, we hope they add that little bit of experience and um, and hopefully we can get more players off island and overseas and, and playing at a better level because, of course, that will that will improve their football, improve them individually and improve us as a team. But, um yeah, it's, the, the, the final thing with that is, um, going back to what you were saying, there's, there's lots of negatives about being a small island, but one of the, the big bonuses is because most of our players are island-based, we can train all the time. So we train regularly, we train twice a week, which is um, certainly an advantage. Uh, we mm -hmm. train at the National Stadium. Um, we use the boxing gym, which is next to the stadium. So we're quite lucky in that way where we'll kind of turn those... Uh, things against us in, in our favour and we'll, we'll train more often and and again with the, with our games being moved from um, October and November to March and or to March and, and further on it gives us that longer time to prepare so um, hopefully by the time we get to those games we'll be in, in better shape and uh, like I said our goal isn't necessarily to win and qualify but our goal is to uh, build and, and show a good account of ourselves so that when the next Nations League process comes about we're in a far better um, a far better state and, and position. Well, I mean, let's just, you know, let's put it into context, okay? An island of 60,000 people, probably the same sort of size of an average town in the UK. You are winning four out of six of your games. Your group's consisting of Aruba, Bermuda, Suriname, Canada. You're doing a very, very good job, quietly. If I've got £100 in my back pocket... Do I put a hundred pound on Cayman Islands to finish in the top three of that world qualifying group? <laughs> uh, I'm not sure. I'm not <laughs> sure. It's, uh, like I said, I think we're we're certainly going as underdogs, but I think we're um, you know stranger things have happened in football, right? We all saw Leicester yeah. win the league. We've all seen Liverpool lose last week, seven two to to Aston Villa. So. Um, yeah, I saw before you're a, you're a Liverpool fan, James. Sorry. Yeah, like <laughs> um, a, that was like a dagger through the heart. Yeah, yeah sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but I may actually said Istanbul, Istanbul then maybe would have been a better one, right? Um, Absolutely. Yeah, but, you know, you're I right. think if, if, if we prepared properly, properly um, and we have a little bit of luck, like we, we did against Barbados, the same thing, we, we prepared uh, in the best possible way and um, we were very well organised. And I think if we do that against anybody and the longer we can contain them and the more confidence can build, then you never know what will happen. Um, we like to, you know, we'd never go into a game thinking we'd be happy with a draw or a loss. So, you know, we, we go into those games wanting to win the games, but we're also realistic knowing that will be um, incredibly tough. So, um, as I said, it's, it's, a, it's a building process. We don't expect to qualify for a World Cup. Um, but, what, you know, the longer term plan, this is essential. We would like, we said before, it's a very young team. We have um, two or three 18-year-olds. Uh, we've got a 17-year-old who's, who's doing very, very well. And um, with the exception of maybe three or four involved in the squad, most players are under kind of 23 years old. So 
we're certainly building for the future as opposed to building for right now. And um, yes, we did very well in the previous process, but um, if, if we're going to really kick on as a nation, we have to get, um, we have to invest ourselves in those younger players and of course use the, the experience and the leadership that some of those older players bring, but really invest in that, in the youth uh, programs, in the younger age groups, the 17s, the 15s and get our domestic leagues right. If we do that, Maybe, you know, I probably won't be here in five, ten years, but um, maybe in, in five, ten years, the Cayman Islands can, can shock somebody and, and, and achieve something because we've kind of built the foundation. So in lots of ways, as well as we're planning for now, we're also planning for the future and kind of leaving a legacy and, and, and building a culture. So, so it's very similar um, to the, the, the BVI in many ways, where they've kind of stripped it back from what it was, heavily um invested into a philosophy of youth take the hit now get these players experience at the level uh, at a high level gain those caps increase those caps and then looking for the you know the, the maybe the 2026 world cup uh mm -hmm. qualifying and, and and look at sort of having a more experienced squad that have been together as a group for a lot longer um i think it seems to be a bit of a theme throughout the caribbean uh, from what i can see there's a lot of teams building now with a lot of good young players. I think in a few years' time, I think we're going to see a bit of an influx of uh, young Caribbean talent coming across into the bigger leagues, um, around, or hopefully even in Europe, you know, getting some of these players across. Um, so it does seem like a real theme, and I think it's the way to go, you know, getting good coaches like yourself across, um, coaching these young players, obviously more receptive at that age. I, I think it's I think it's really impressive to be fair, and I think it's a good, really good way to go. Yeah, just to touch on that very quickly, um, take a look at Africa. Look at the African nations. You go back to the late '60s, early '70s, mid '80s, um, and then obviously they were putting these sort of things in place in Africa in the late '80s, early '90s, and then lo and behold, USA '94 it comes out and then World Cup 98, that great Nigeria team that, that done so well at the Olympics in America. And it seems to me that there's a, a parallel, something's happening, a shift is happening. Um, I think um, it's really opened our eyes as normal uh, football purist fans, general normal fans. Um, I think you're doing a great job and you should be commended. One question I have got for you, which I've been thinking about, um, what's a typical day in the life of an international football manager in the Cayman Islands? Yeah, so it's very varied uh, day to day. Um, I have a, a couple of other roles as well as being the head coach. So I also um, I also lead the, the coach education department. So we've currently just held three CONCACAF D licenses back to back and the final group has their assessments this weekend. So CONCACAF have held them via Zoom, um, but all the practical work I've done. So I spend a lot of time at the moment doing that. And then... Um, I also am um, um, uh, director of um, coaching as well. So looking after the younger players, watching. And as I said, because our players are, uh, are island-based, the 17s and 15s train all the time as well, both the, the men's and the women's, the boys and the girls. So um, we, we train most days. I'll be coaching most days in some capacity, whether that be with younger age groups or with the men in the evening. Um, but also looking after um, the domestic leagues, so trying to organise... Um, the youth leagues which are supposed to start in a couple of weeks and the senior league where we're now into the uh, third round of, or third week of the season um, drastically increased the number of games last season I think they played 11 games this season they're playing I think it's 25 or nearly 30 games with cup competition so managing and looking after that we're trying to get a grassroots program going as well so working in schools and getting the community um, a bit more involved that way so my day-to-day -day is, is, is very varied, that with meetings with CONCACAF and with FIFA. and um, it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's quite full-on, but I'm very lucky that I work in something that I, I thoroughly enjoy. So um, it's, uh, it's certainly a, a nice place to live and a, and a lovely job to have. So um, it's a very, very, very day, with, which is, is great for me. Yeah, it's what we said to Dan Neville. I'll say the same thing again. You're up at two o'clock in the morning on Football Manager. Your wife's asleep. The kids are in bed. You're in the Caribbean. You're in a World Cup qualifier. You know, you get through. No one believes you, but you're actually living it. Um, as far as I'm concerned, what a job. What you get, you know, you wake up in the morning. What, what have you got planned today, Ben? Yeah, I'm just going to be on the phone to FIFA. You know, nothing, nothing major. 
you know yeah it was so a, I think, it yeah, was the first brilliant. time it was the, <laughs> the first time in my life i've been i've been i've been fed some uh, pretty bad excuses in my life and uh, and obviously this was obviously legit from you ben you had to push the podcast back by a couple of days because you were in meetings with fifa I mean, how can we, yeah. we can't compete with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, it's, uh, it, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a great job and it's, the people are great. And um, I'm lucky that the, the president of the Football Association, Alfredo Whitaker, is, is fantastic in, in his enthusiasm and his drive. And he's so passionate about the game and about um, helping and developing football across the island. So it's, uh, yeah, it might, like I said, it, lots of variation with a job, but it's, you know, I, I couldn't be happier. I really couldn't. Um, and then, and then finally, we've touched on an awful lot of stuff. The time goes ever so quick. Um, your future, okay. Where do you want to go? What, what do you want to do? Do you want to get experience going around the world? Do you want to test the waters in China? Do you want to take the short hop over to Florida, or, or do you want to come home? How how does it work for yeah, yourself, sure. Ben? Yeah, um, I don't have too much of a plan if, if I'm honest. Um, um, I'm certainly. Um, have aspirations of coaching at the top level, um, mm. one day working at, at the highest possible level, whether that be in England or elsewhere. Um, but like I said, I, th- I think in football, it's very difficult to plan a journey because you, if I was planning my journey at Ipswich, I never would have said I'll go and work and coach an international team in the Caribbean. That would never have been on my, yeah. on my radar. So um, I'd like to one day work in club football because I think that um, the, the one downside to international football is number of games. Um, of course, there's lots of benefits of working in international football and the opposition and, and, and the travel been to some, you know, unbelievable places. But, um, yeah, like I said, I'm quite open-minded and I'm certainly, um, I'm certainly um, not looking for anything right now and, and I'm happy where I am and I think there's a lot to do here and, and we'll, we'll just see what happens further down the line. I'd, I'd like to come home at some point, um, but certainly not yet. So uh, here's a scenario for you, Ben. All right, you've, you've had a really successful World Cup qualifying campaign. You just miss out on qualifying. You just narrowly miss out on goal difference to Canada. Alfonso Davies has scored a last-minute winner in the Cayman Islands to knock you out. You're thinking where you're going to go next. The phone rings. A National League club. Just bumbling around the relegation zone. Let's say it's Kings Lynn. Ben, we really need you to come in. Please, will you come in and be our manager? Would that tempt you? Um, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's uh, it's, it depends on the time and the situation. Uh, like I said, I, I think it's a really good project here, and to bring me away from here would have to be a, another really good project around with, with people who I think you know are the right people. Um, whether that be the the owner, whether that be the president of a football association, whoever it be, I'd have to have very similar goals and uh, values to, as to what they have. So, uh, yeah, I, I don't know. I honestly don't know. It's uh, you know, I think it's it's one of them things that we can't plan for and we'll just see what happens. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, you're working extensive work with the youth players and the youth systems at the clubs that you've been at and obviously the international scene, you're building from the bottom up. I mean, one one way that you could go potentially is to still continue to work with that, but at a monster club. Um, those <laughs> jobs are highly sought after, sought after too. And if I was an employer and, and someone of your calibre comes in with that resume, I'd find that very difficult to turn down, if I'm honest with you. I think you're a class act. I think you've done a great job. Um, as far absolutely. as I'm concerned, yeah. But yeah, no, I, it's been an absolute privilege to have you on our podcast, as far as I'm concerned. The dream game that we want to see is the British Virgin Islands against, uh, against the Cayman Islands. I think uh, I'd yeah, love sure. to commentate on that. Uh, that would be great. Um, but, uh, you know, look. I see, what, I, I see what we can do. Yeah. See if we can organise a friendly at some point. <laughs> that would be great. If you, if you do, yeah. let us know, right? Because uh, we're, we're dying yeah. to get over to the Caribbean. That's one thing we're yeah. desperate for, is to get over to the Caribbean and watch some football. Yeah, definitely. No, 100%.